this. We have our resistor. We have our capacitor. R C. And this is what we're given. Whoops, that's given. Given the voltage applied by the this thing at its peak is going to equal 230 volts. The resistance is going to equal 150 ohms. The capacitance is going to equal 15 microfarads. And finally, the frequency, that's gonna be important, the frequency at which this AC circuit oscillates is given by 55 Hertz. So go ahead, write that down. And the first question I have for you is, what is the impedance? Take a second, write it down. I have to turn off my fan, otherwise there's static noise. Oh, there. Okay. So, to find the impedance, we just use our equation Z equals the square root of R squared. In this case, it's going to be the capacitive reactance squared. And so what is the capacitive reactance? Well, we are given the frequency, so we can find the capacitive reactance. Xc is equal to 1 over uh, omega times the capacitance, or we could write it as 1 over 2 pi times the frequency times the capacitance, C. So if you do that, plug it in. Um, make sure that you change 15 to 15 uh, times 10 to the power minus 6. That's a microfarad. And I think everything else is the same. This is in volts. So when you clean all this up, you will get a value of 193 ohms. Okay, so Xc is equal to 193 ohms, and then we know what R is, it's given by 150. We know what Xc is, it's given by 193, and we can solve for the impedance. The impedance is going to equal uh, 244 ohms. Okay, so I'll write that over here just so we have it. X C was equal to 193 and Z is equal to 244 ohms. All right, so that's that. The second question, the second question is going to be, what is the RMS current? So B, what is the RMS current through the circuit? So we've got the question mark. What is the I RMS current through the circuit? So to find I RMS current, we're going to use the voltage root mean squared through the current, okay? So I R M S is going to equal the voltage root mean squared divided by the impedance. Well, we know impedance. We don't know the root mean squared voltage, but we have an equation that we learned a while ago. To solve for the root mean squared voltage, we take the peak voltage applied 
and divide it by the square root of two. So the peak voltage applied is given by 230 volts. Plugging that in, we will get a peak voltage of 163 volts. And we know what the impedance is, so the root mean voltage is going to be 163 volts divided by the impedance, 244 ohms. And we will get a value of 0 0.67 I am peers. Okay. And so let's put that there as well. Why not? So where am I going to, I need a different color. The root mean velocity VRMS was equal to 163 and IRMS was equal to 0 0.67. Okay. The next question. The next question we have is going to be what is the power factor? What is the power factor? And the phase angle phi, question mark. So what is the power factor and what is the phase angle? So what we can do is we can make a right triangle here using our uh, phaser diagrams and we can do it for a resistors instead of voltages because resistors and voltages are gonna be kind of in the same direction here. So what you're going to get is the hypotenuse of your triangle is given by the impedance Z. Going down is going to be uh, X at C and going across is going to be R. Okay, and this angle right here is phi. So this is our triangle that we're gonna be using here and this is the resistances that go with it. And if you had inductors and capacitors, again, you're going to get something similar to this. If you had inductors instead of capacitors, you'll still have something similar to this. So what we want to do first is find the power factor. We want to find the power factor. So the power factor is given by cosine of phi. But we don't know phi yet. So we're not going to use that equation. The other equation we could use, well, cosine is just equal to the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So we'll just use that. The power factor is just R divided by Z. We know R, we know Z, so we can plug in 150 divided by 244, and the power factor is going to be 0 0.615. 0 0.615 or we can say 61.5%. So that is the power factor. And the other question is asking us for the phase angle. Well, typically, normally, the way we find the phase angle is we use the tangent. So tangent arc of, uh, what is it, opposite over adjacent, so xc over r. And we could find what phase angle phi is, or because we know that this is 66.15%, we can just use the cosine value again. So we can say that phi is equal to cosine arc of 0 0.615. And then you get your phase angle. And the phase angle is going to be 53, yep, 52. Uh, degrees. So that's how much it's out of phase. The resistor is, the, or the current is from the actual impedance. So that is how much it's going to be out of phase. Now the next thing, by the way, everything I'm doing, I'm going to repeat again. So follow along the first time if you're confused. The second time we do it, it's going to be the same exact stuff. So nothing, 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 nothing too crazy. 
the next question, this isn't something we've talked about too much of, so this might be new to you, is what is the real power? Uh, what, what letter are we on, D? What is the real, oops, real power? And that symbol we use P. And what is the reactive power? And that letter, I know we used this letter before, but we're going to use it again, Q. So we talk about Q as Q factor, but here we're using capital Q for the reactive power. So what is the real power and what is the reactive power? To find the real power is pretty simple. To find the real power, the actual power that's being used, you dissipated here, we say the real power is equal to VRMS, we know that, multiplied by IRMS, multiplied by this, now you know why it's called a power factor, cosine phi. To find the real power, you need to do VRMS times IRMS times this, and you will get the real power. The co this is the power factor here. And we know what the power factor is. We know what this is. We know what this is. So it's going to be 163 times 0 0.67 times cosine, which was 0 0.615. When you multiply all those together, you will get the real power, which is going to equal 67. And the units for power are the watts. Then we want to find the reactive power. Now, the reactive power is actually not that difficult to find. The reactive power is just the sine version of this. So it's still VRMS, I times RMS, but now it's going to be sine times phi. And the reactive power is going to be 86. Okay? You can't see that. So VRMS times IRMS times sine phi is equal to 86. Now the units for reactive power Q, the units for this reactive power, we could say watts. It's still watts technically, but we don't write it as watts. So just like when we're talking about um, momentum and impulse, momentum has the units of kilograms, meters per second. That's the units for momentum. But impulse has the units of Newton seconds. They're the same units. Like they, they work out to be the same thing, but we don't call them the same thing. And we're going to do the same thing here. We're not going to call this watts, even though it is a watt. What we're going to call it is a volt ampere. A volt ampere. And we're going to put a little R there. Volt ampere R. And the R stands for reactive so volt ampere of the reactants, okay? And the units for this are watts, but we just call it this. And actually, if you look at some of your circuit, like if you look at a power adapter and stuff, you'll sometimes see stuff written like this, and then sometimes you'll see this. This unit right here is watts, but it's the reactive power, okay? And there's just one more part to this question, and we're finished. The last part of this question is what is the apparent power consumed? Ooh, 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 what color? Let's use black. So part E, what is the apparent power. And for apparent power, we use the letter S. So to find the apparent power, you don't use sine or cosine. You just call VRMS times IRMS. And that's it. That is the apparent power. And it's going to equal 109. And again, we're not going to use the units of volts here. Uh, watts, we're going to use the units of 
volt times ampere, but we're not going to put the R here because it's not the uh, reactance power, reactive power, it's the apparent power. So it's going to be 109 volt amperes. Now there is one other way of doing this exact same question, and it's called uh, using a power triangle. And what you do is you make your phase diagram or your uh, real and imaginary. And along this axis, you put the real. The real is going to be the real power. So here we would put our real power P. And then going along, it doesn't matter which axis you use. If we're using capacitors, we go down. If we're using inductors, we go up. But it doesn't really matter. And then you have the reactance power going here. So that's Q. And what you do is you just use head to tail method. So where you stopped, this is where you end. And this value right here from the center to this point right here is S. So if this is P and this is Q, all right, you can find the apparent power by doing Pythagorean theorem. So the other way of doing the Finding the apparent power is just S is equal to the square root of P squared plus Q squared. And you'll end up with 109 volt amperes as well. And here, what's really cool about this drawing, this drawing, the drawing, draw, 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 this drawing here, well, I just broke down for a sec, that this angle is phi. It's the phase shift. So we found phase shift the other way, but we can find it this way too. So if I'd given you the power and the, uh, sorry, the reactive power and the real power, you can find the phase shift. So here the phase shift is going to be the arc tangent of opposite Q over P. Okay. So there it is. That's everything that we're gonna be doing today. So let's repeat that. We're gonna repeat the same thing, except now we're gonna be looking at the L R, uh, what is it? RL circuit. So let's get rid of the RC and call it an RL circuit. And what are we gonna do? We are going to remove we are going to remove our capacitor, which means all this stuff is gone. We're gonna remove our capacitor and we're gonna put an inductor there. L, and L is equal to, uh, what is L equal to? L is equal to 750 millihenry. 750 milli Henry. So milli is 10 to the power minus three if you forgot. Here's our circuit. Go ahead and work it out. I'm gonna give you the same exact questions and you tell me what each of those values are. So part A was what is the impedance? Go ahead, work it out. Take a second to do it. All right, all right, all right. So impedance here is going to be the square root of R squared plus the inductive reactance, L. And how do you find the inductive reactance? It's gonna be two pi times the frequency times the inductor value instead of one over all that. We do that we are going to get, what are we gonna get? 259 ohms, is that right? Yeah, 200, that's not a two. 259 ohms, and then we can plug it into here, and it's gonna be 
150 squared plus 259 squared square rooted, and you will get a value of 300 ohms. So Z, oops, XL is equal to 259. And Z is equal to 300 ohms. All right. And then the next part is, it's the same question. What is the root mean square current? So part B is what is IRMS? And we do the same thing we did in the uh, first question. IRMS is equal to the voltage RMS divided by Z. So take a second to figure out what the voltage RMS is. I mean, you're I'm literally take a second. Look at the look at the page before. If you if you were actually writing this out, you know the answer to that. V RMS is equal to the peak voltage divided by the square root of two. And we already did this. The peak voltage from the last question didn't change here. So it's gonna be 163 volts. But what is gonna be different is Z. So Z is now 300. And so when we plug in uh, 163 divided by 300, we will get a current root mean squared of 0 0.54 amperes. Yeah, good, 0 0.543, we'll, we'll make it even more accurate. And so let's keep going. Tell me what the power factor is and write it down. Let's see who does it first. I'm gonna write it down. We're gonna find the power factor and the phase angle. That's our goal. So part C, power factor and the phase angle. To find the power factor, uh, the equation is cosine of phi, but we don't know this. What we do know, the equation for power factor is going to be XL divided by uh, R. And if you don't know why, you draw out your triangle. This is Z, this side is R, this side's gonna be XL, and this is gonna be the phase angle phi. So if you want to know what cosine phi is, you do the, well, did I do that wrong? I think I did that wrong. I didn't want to write that. I wanted to write R over Z. There we go. So yes, I agree with you. The power factor is going to equal 0.5. 0 0.5, I'm just gonna copy Zoe's. I got, I, I put 0 0.5, but Zoe's more accurate than me, 0 0.59. And that's going to be 50% is our power factor. 50.01% if we're gonna be more accurate. And then phase angle is going to be cosine, oops, of this value 0 0.5 and that's going to be 59 degrees, 59.9 degrees. But Zoe, I'm just gonna round it. I'm just gonna say 60 degrees because 60 degrees is, is a nice number. So from there, what is the real power? What is the reactive power? The real power, what, what, what letter are we on, D? So the real power and the reactive power. The real power is just VRMS times IRMS times the power factor cosine phi. The reactive power is VRMS, IRMS, sine phi, and we will get, did you beat me to it yet? What were our answers? I'm gonna get 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 44. Yeah, 
44 watts. And Q is going to be 70, 70, 70, 70, 70, what? 76.1 ampere, volt ampere reactants. Good. And then the last question is what is S? You know, for part D, I'm just going to write Q and S and all that stuff there together. So for S, it's just D R M S multiplied by I R M S. And so the apparent, you've heard that term apparent before, apparent like apparent weight. This is the apparent power. The apparent weight is going to be equal to uh, seven, not 76, what is it? It's gonna be this number. I forget what that number is. The RMS is 163 multiplied by, yeah, good, 87.96, or we'll just round it to, we'll just round it to 88 uh, volts per ampere. Okay, good. The last question, the last question for today. By the way, I have, I have an assignment for you to try. This is optional, you don't have to do it. And I'll tell you about it at the end. I did a workshop yesterday for teaching and I thought I saw something really cool. I never see these things as cool as this. So I thought we could try it, but we'll do it afterwards. So we're gonna look at the RLC circuit now. So we need to put a capacitor here as well. And just for make everything easy, we're gonna keep everything the same and put our old capacitor, which was 15 microfarads. All right. So first question, what is impedance? Go ahead. You got to be careful with this one though. Impedance, we have an equation for impedance for an RLC circuit in series, which is what this is. Okay. So the equation is going to be Z equals the square root of R squared plus XL minus XC R squared. And I got the same exact thing, but we're gonna round it up to 60, 164. Really quickly though, let's just put our numbers in. XL and XC, we already got from the last two parts. So XL was equal to 190, 259, 259. And this one was 164, one, oh, that was way off, 193 ohms. So you plug it into here and you will get Z is roughly 164 ohms. Good. Let's keep going. So we got 164 ohms and then we're going to do part B, C, and D. It's the same stuff. So what is the IRMS? That one's pretty easy now because we know that the uh, voltage isn't going to change. The voltage RMS over Z. So from the last two questions, the voltage RMS was equal to 163. And it's not gonna be anything different here. And Z is equal to, we said Z was equal to 100 
and 64. 163 divided by 164, that number is going to be pretty close to 1. In fact, it's going to be, what's 163 divided by 164? 0 0.999, or, or let's just round it to 1. So it's one amp, more or less. What are the power factor and the uh, phase shift is the next question. So the power factor and the phase shift phi, power factor is equal to cosine of phi which is just R divided by Z. Still, it's going to be R divided by Z. So we know R is 150, and we know Z is 164, and that's going to equal, I agree with you, 91.6. So 0 0.916, which is 91.6% is the power factor, and phi is equal to cosine of 0. Point, you're going too fast, 0 0.9, and that is equal to 23.27, 23.75 degrees, I agree. And then finally, let's just figure out what the real power is, the reactive power, and the uh, um, Apparent power, let's just do all three of them at the same time. So we want to know what the power is, the reactive power, and the apparent power. Power is going to equal VRMS times IRMS times cosine phi. Q, which is the uh, reactive power, is VRMS. I R M S sine phi and S is just V R M S times I R M S. And there's no phi angle there. So we can multiply each one of these and let's see what our values turn out to be. So V R M S 163 times one roughly times cosine of 20, was it 23.75? So multiply all of those together, you get 149 watts. 48. And then this one is going to be 65.29. 65.29. Ampere, volts, ampere volts, ampere, reactants, and finally S is equal to 162.2 volt amperes without the reactant symbol. And so that's it. We are done with AC circuits. There are more challenging questions, but for now, if you can understand how to like use this, great, 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 great. And there's also the natural frequency. If you wanted to know what the natural frequency of this is, it would be one over the square root of R times, uh, one over the square root of L times C. So that's the natural frequency, but we don't need to worry about that now. Here's the, here's my, uh, uh, what's assignment. It's an optional assignment, but I thought it was pretty cool. So yesterday I was in a PD I'm not drinking water today. I'm drinking green tea, by the way. I went green tea. No sugar, though. Yesterday, I was at a, uh, a professional development for teachers. And what is this? I got my tea, too. All right. Green tea today. So we were having a uh, like different projects we could give to students. And one of them was something I really liked. You have to create a sport that you could play on the moon. And you have to tell me what 
would be different or you could invent a new sport but that sport has to be on the moon for example one sport you couldn't play is uh um squash because squ squash isn't a sport but a real sport like uh basketball you couldn't really play on the moon because the gravity on the moon is one sixth that's right taking some cheap shots so gravity on the moon is one sixth of the earth. So if you try bouncing something, you would fly up. Another thing, why this matters, think about the force of friction, right? The reason why we move is because there's a friction force on our feet. Now, if gravity is one sixth that, then we're not going to move the way we do. We're gonna actually slip some more because there's not enough traction. So things like track or running, have to be adjusted somehow. Otherwise, you, you wouldn't be able to play the same way. Um, something else you want to think about is sports where you're like doing physical contact. Now, the acceleration has changed on the moon. Hide and seek's not a sport. But anyways, the acceleration is the thing that's changing, right? So if the acceleration changes, it would be really good for high jumpers, but high jumpers, um, yeah, I guess it would be pretty good for high jumpers. It would be, you would have to change the, the, the height that is required. Otherwise, everybody could high jump. So if you wanted high jumping to be the same as high jumping on the earth, one thing you could do is add more mass. But the way we think about mass is going to be very weird too on the moon. Like it's not just gravity that's changing. It, you need to gain some speed, yeah. But not only that, um, if you think about mass, when we're talking about the moon, sure, it's going to be easier to lift this way because the acceleration is less. I agree with that. But if you're trying to push it this way, remember the Y component is different than the X component. The X component is the same as the Earth. So if you take something with a lot of mass and you're trying to push it this way, it's going to be exactly the same, assuming there's no friction, it's going to be exactly the same as trying to push it on the earth. So we're getting this weird thing where we're getting a mixture of what we can do that's similar to the earth, but what we can't do, which would be similar to the earth, which is like, instead of just like, if you were playing football, let's say, you would just push somebody this way, right? Or you try to pause them this way. But if you're on the moon, maybe that's not a good idea because that's a lot of mass coming at you and it's, you know, you might not want to do that. What you might want to do instead is if somebody is coming at you with the ball and you want to block them, what you could do is instead of pushing them this way, you could push them up because it's going to be easier to lift somebody on the moon. So think about a sport that you would create um, they asked me to do it as well. And the sport I was thinking of, like how I would adjust it is curling because curling isn't a sport to me, but I still did it anyway because I thought it was funny. And curling is weird because it requires friction. So uh, skating on ice would be very weird on the moon because you don't need ice to skate anymore. On the moon, it's, everything is going to be so weird, even just like how your legs move. So when you move forward, your legs are sort of like a pendulum moving. So when you're on the moon, you're not going to have gravity bringing you back down or not as fast anymore. And so if you look at astronauts on the moon, they have their hands up like this because they're trying to reconcile the loss of the gravity. So it's very, very weird. Thank you, Zoe. Golf is not a sport. Golf is a game that is played by people who can't do sports. Thank you. I know you didn't add all that, but I'm going to add all that part to it. Golf isn't a sport. Uh, what? So think about sports. Uh, track and field is a sport. Uh, tennis is a sport. Uh, gymnastics. Gymnastics on the moon. Are you kidding me? How many of you can do somersaults right now or can do backflips? I know I certainly can't, but if you're on the moon... Almost anybody could do a backflip. So now we have to think about backflips, um, like how many you could do instead of just one. If you're a professional gymnast, you could do like 15 backflips or something. 
Oh, you did do gymnastics. All right. Well, most of us can't do backflips. Zoe can. Um, and so you could think about that. And then even balancing and doing all those other kinds of things in gymnastics would be really weird on the moon. And I've actually never thought of that until yesterday. Like, I always thought, oh, the acceleration would be different. But, you know, I used to be able to do back handsprings. Those are hard. Those are the ones where you go like this and then you push. That's not easy. But then again, I, I like how you said I used to, which implies you can't do it anymore. <laughs> and skateboarding would be pretty cool to watch. So skateboarding on uh, Earth, you know, people can rotate 100, what is it, three times. So that's 1080. On the moon, it would be like you'd be rotating 20 times or something before you got down. And another thing that's really interesting I, I thought about was baseball, even though I, I, I could care less about baseball. Think about how boring baseball would be on the moon. Uh, <laughs> good, 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 good. I think uh, like baseball, when you hit the ball, right, it's going to go into projectile motion. And it's going to take maybe a couple of seconds, five, six seconds for it being in the air and then coming down. Baseball would be so boring watching it on like the moon. If you hit the ball with the same, uh, if you give it the same impulse, it's going to be in the air for like 30, 40 seconds now. So it's going to be six times the, the, the time or the distance it's going to go as well. And so baseball fields would have to be bigger. Um, I, I don't know. I thought that would be kind of cool. But for like this class, I was thinking like that's sports and those are all mechanical things. Rotational motion would, how would that change? And then also what about electromagnetism? How would that E&M change on the moon? We do take things for granted on the moon that, you know, the reason why I'm not, go ow, the reason why I'm not going through the floor here is because there's an electro uh, magnetic force that's repelling me upwards. In mechanics, we call that the normal force, but it's actually a force of repulsion from the atoms in my body, in my legs, that are repelling against the atoms in the floor. So how would all of this kind of, these little things affect you? Uh, just some food for thought, and you don't have to write anything down, but on Monday, we'll have a discussion just at the end and we'll talk about like what sport you came up with.